letters EWTN to 55000 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. If you'd like to be part of the program here on EWTN's Open Line Thursday, Father Brian Milady is in the house back home in Portland. He was, uh, we thought he had business abroad, but as it turns out, he was just riding out the heat wave. Um, but he is, go ahead. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, you can always send us an email also. The email address is openline at EWTN.com. Openline at EWTN.com. If you're outside the United States and Canada, we'd still love to hear for uh, hear from you via the telephone. Your number is 1-205-271-2985. And we'll put you straight to the front of the line if you're outside the United States and Canada at 1-205-271-2985. You can always send us an email, openline at EWTN.com, as I mentioned earlier. And you can text your question. Text the letters EWTN to 55000. Wait for a response, text your first name and your question message, and data rates may apply. I'm Jack Williams, Michael McCall, producing the program. Your call screener and social media maven is Mr. Jeff Burson. So if you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook Live, you can type a question into the chat window and it may find its way to us by the end of the program. And our host is he is every Thursday, Father Brian Milady OP. How are you? Is peachy, thank you. How are you? I'm terrific, thanks. It's good to see you back in your own digs. Oh, may I? I agree. <laughs> um, very special uh, young lady that we're uh, remembering today, uh, St. Mary Magdalene. And uh, she was front and center in a good part of the New Testament, huh? Yes, she was. And not only that, but we have a special devotion to her. In the Dominican order, she's called the protectress of the order. And there's several reasons for that. The first is that there was a great devotion to her in southern France. And there was a, a pious tradition that she'd actually visited southern France during her lifetime. And that's probably a legend. No one really knows. But at any rate, where our order was founded, it was a very prevalent legend. Also, however... We see in the life of Mary Magdalene very important things that have to do with our conversion and our life as a Christian. First of all, as you know, by tradition, she was the woman of her, out of whom Jesus cast seven devils. So obviously she was very grateful to him, but she loved him very much. And she loved him, not in, a, of course, an erotic sense, but she loved him as um, the person who had saved her from sin. And she appreciated his life so much. Now this is seen in the fact that unlike most of the apostles who were called by Christ, you could say in a way to be the first bishops, etc., she didn't desert him in his passion. Instead she was with the family. And not only that, but you remember she went to anoint his body and then she couldn't find his body, and two angels sat there, and they told her that he had risen from the dead. In fact, the Easter sequence, Victime Pascali Laudas, says it in a beautiful way, Speak, Mary, declaring what you saw wayfaring. I saw the tomb of Christ who is risen, and the glory of Jesus' resurrection. So in other words, she's the first witness also to the resurrection, and not only that, but when she actually experiences Jesus, I noticed Father John Paul on EWN had a long discussion of encounter this morning. When she encounters Jesus, because he speaks her name after she doesn't recognize him, then she says to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And then remember, he tells her, Stop, don't keep on clinging to me because your mission is to go and announce the resurrection. To whom? Well, the tradition of the church is that she is the female apostle, in Latin, apostola, to all the male apostles, apostolorum. 
because she is the one that testifies to the resurrection of the dead to them in order to encourage them to believe. And the preface of the Mass is quite interesting today in this regard. It says this, that uh, God's mercy is shown no less in his power to preach the gospel to everyone through Christ our Lord. In the garden he appeared to Mary Magdalene who loved him in life, who witnessed his death on the cross, who sought him as he lay in the tomb, who was the first to adore him when he rose from the dead, and whose apostolic duty was honored by the apostles that the good news of life might reach the ends of the earth. So we see in this simple woman, but a woman who is filled with much love and also much gratitude for her own repentance, first of all, the contemplation of Christ, from love she wishes to be near him, but then she demonstrates the more perfect way of life because she doesn't just sit there and sign a, kind of some kind of contemplative stupor. Once she sees the risen Lord, he tells her, you can't just be with me. Now you have to go and proclaim this. Now, all Christians, then, the ideal life in this world, not the next world, and the next world will be contemplation. But the ideal life in this world is the life in which we contemplate God, which means to say that we have a loving personal relationship with him of which we are aware on a daily basis, and that we share it with others, our families, our friends. And this can be either by word or by deed, the fruits of that contemplation. Now, of course, that's also the, one of the mottos of the Dominican order, to contemplate and to give the others the fruits of your contemplation. And St. Thomas is very clear that though the contemplative life, strictly speaking, is the most perfect way of life on earth because we have only yet see God because we're not yet in heaven, the life of faith in which we experience him in our hearts and then proclaim him, again, either by word or by deed, is in fact the more perfect. So we as Christians need the example of Magdalene, who was present at Christ's passion, who went to his tomb, who experienced his resurrection, and then proclaim this to the other apostles throughout the world. It is in this experience that we find an ordinary Christian, what it means to implement what Vatican II calls the universal call to holiness. So today we ask St. Mary Magdalene to be our intercessor and to pray for us that we might embrace him too and that we might say with her, uh, Raboni, mm -hmm. which means teacher when he calls us by name. Was she the woman that was about to be stoned? Well, the sources disagree about that. <laughs> <laughs> so I have no judgment about that. The sources disagree about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mel Gibson but clearly took, took was, a little creative license there. Well, no, no, I took don't a think position that's true. anyway. Well, uh, the fathers of the church have a. Some say yes, some say no, but certainly she loved much. And Christ says this about the woman member who wiped his feet with her hair, and she's often identified with that woman too. Mm -hmm. um, she's been forgiven much. And so she loves much. Well, the important lesson is we've been forgiven much too. And so we must love much also. Just getting started on a Thursday edition of EWTN's Open Line. Father Brian Milady is in the house ready to take your questions. If you'd like to be part of the program, simply pick up the phone and give us a call at one 833 288 E W T N. That's 833 288 3986. It's a free phone call anywhere in North America. If you're outside the United States and Canada, we'd still love to hear from you. That number is 1 205 271 2985. And we'll even put you straight to the front of the line if you are from outside North America at a, at 205 rather 1205271 you can always send us an email openline at ewtn.com 
and put something like Father Brian or Thursday in the subject line, and we'll get it to the appropriate folder. And you can even text your question. Text the letters EWTN to 55000. Wait for a response. Text your first name and your question. Message and data rates may apply. It's EWTN's Open Line Thursday with Father Brian Milady. Patrick and a panel of international contributors showcase the universality of Catholicism. Each week on the Catholic Sphere, we connect with EWTN contributors from different parts of the world. Each, I think, has a unique perspective on issues of concern for all of us as Catholics. It reminds us that we're really a universal church. Christ called all of us to be his disciples. The Catholic Sphere, Sunday afternoon, 2.30 Eastern on EWTN Radio. And welcome once again. This is an EWTN Bookmark Brief. I'm Doug Kack, your host. Just had the pleasure of speaking with an old friend, Tom Nash, about his book, The Rosary, 20 Answers, published by Catholic Answers. Tell us, Tom, what made you decide to put a book together on the rosary? Well, Doug, I think it's important for people to see the rosary as an encounter with Jesus Christ, because as a friend once called it, the rosary is the gospel on a string. And knowing that Jesus is a faithful uh, Savior, we see that in his disciple par excellence, Doug, the Blessed Mother, with her assumption and her crowning in heaven, shows that Jesus does what he says he will do. And what mother doesn't intercede for her children? We know that she is because Revelation 12 tells us that she's there in heaven and she's interceding for us as we know that the saints otherwise do in heaven as the Bible affirms. Thank you, Tom Nash, author of The Rosary, 20 Answers, published by Catholic Answers. And this has been an EWTN Bookmark Brief. We shall catch you next This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question, call 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. Or send us an email to openline at EWTN.com. That's 833-288-EWTN. It's our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. Um, if you are uh, looking for uh, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass and perhaps you don't have the luxury of being able to get to one in your area or you have a work schedule conflict or something, we broadcast the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass every single day at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. have done it for over 25 years, so be sure to check it out. The Holy Sacrifice of the Mass with the, Mass, rather, with the Franciscan Missionaries of the Eternal Word uh, every day, Monday through, uh, actually Monday through Sunday, at uh, 8 a.m. Eastern Time right here on EWTN Radio and Television. First up today is Joe in the great state of New York, listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Joe, you are on with Father Brian Milady. Hi, Joe. Hello, Father. Hello, can you hear me okay? We can hear you great. Great. Okay. I've been struggling a lot with the uh, Eucharist, um... And I've, um, I've been a Catholic for most of my life, um, and I've, I've been to church, and I've, I've made friendships and families and all kinds of... I, I want you to understand that, that I've got a different perspective on this from different angles. So my question is, what is the value of the Eucharist? What is the value of communion when, when we don't live Christ-like lives? Well, um, when you don't live a Christ-like life, I don't know what you mean by that. If you mean we're struggling to live a Christ-like life, but we're not perfect at it, well, that's why we need the Eucharist. The Eucharist is our spiritual food on our journey to heaven. It's also one of the two necessary sacraments. The first necessary sacrament is baptism, because it's by that that we're introduced into the ability to live a Christ-like life. The Eucharist is like food, just as we need food to eat once we're born and live a natural life, so we need a spiritual food to support our supernatural life. Now, the expression you use, Christ-like life, is extremely vague. Do you mean you're in the state of mortal sin all the time? 
Well, you shouldn't be receiving the Eucharist then until you confess. If you mean, however, that you're not a perfect Christian, well, not too many people are. And the reason the Lord instituted the Holy Eucharist so was that so he might, you know, his flesh might mingle with ours, which is what happens at Holy Communion. And in the words of St. Augustine, he said, in all other food, the food becomes us. You know, if I eat enough bread, and Lord knows I've done so in my life, you can see, probably can't see how fat I am, but I have some fat. Uh, the food becomes us through digestion. But in the Eucharist, because it's a spiritual, miraculous presence of our Lord, we become the food. So that it's precisely in order to live a Christ-like life that we have to participate in Christ's cross. And we have to participate in it not just on a monthly basis or a yearly basis, but we have to do so on a weekly basis, plus the fact that it fulfills the commandment in justice and the Ten Commandments to keep holy the Sabbath. So all religions are called to keep holy, you know, whatever days they consider to be the Lord's Day. But we have a special commandment in this because our keeping holy of the Sabbath is where we make Christ sacrifice our own. And we offer ourselves in oblation with him, and we receive the life of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Now, all of us are foolish of heart and slow to believe in a way, except, of course, Mary. So, and maybe Joseph. But we all have to deal with the fact that we're not what we should be. But you see, that's the Eucharist has a healing dimension also. It's like medicine for the soul. So that when the food, it's like natural food again, where we eat a healthy diet in order to help us when we're sick to recover, if we're able to, and also to help us to live our natural life in a fairly peaceful and painless way. So our weekly reception of Holy Communion, or at least presence of the sacrifice of the Mass, helps to form our souls in a healthy way. So we need it for the sake of spiritual health. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. We head next to Concord, New Hampshire. William is in the great state of New Hampshire listening on Hope FM. William, thanks for holding on. Welcome to the program. Thank Hi, you. William. So, So my question is... Um, you know, I've heard about these some priests lately who have been uh, lost their faculties in their dioceses. I'm thinking of Father Altman, but there are others, of course. And my question is, I know that priests, it's happened in our diocese, can just transfer to another diocese. Now, if the priest has lost his faculties, is he able to transfer to, under, to another bishop? Uh, as far as I know, he is, but both the bishops have to accept the transfer. So, remember, he was educated for the diocese in which he lives, and he has a special a relationship with that particular bishop. Now, if he wants to have a relationship with another bishop, that particular bishop, the one in the first diocese, has to agree. And he also has to be willing to have him lose him, you know, for the rest of his life to someplace else. But he can try to change dioceses. He certainly has the right to try. But as I say, the, both the bishops have to accept the, the transfer. Thanks, William. We appreciate the question today. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. Ellie is in New York City, a first-time caller watching us on YouTube today. Ellie, welcome to the program. You're on with Father Brian. Hi. Hi. Nice talk talking to you, Father. Same here. Okay, so this is my question. Why is the Nativity of the Virgin Mary celebrated in some countries more than others? And where and when did the feast start? You mean the birthday of Mary or the birthday of Jesus? Yes, the birthday of Mary. 
Oh, the birthday of Mary. Uh, well, I don't remember why it started. I have a feeling it was connected. I'd have to look it up on, uh, let's say, YouTube or something, Wikipedia. But um, I have a feeling that it started in relationship to the dedication of a church, perhaps in Palestine, uh, that celebrated the Nativity of Mary. Now remember, Mary's Nativity is when she's brought forth to the world, and it's the fruit of the Immaculate Conception. So you have many, several different aspects of Our Lady's life that are celebrated as feasts because they point out to us various aspects of her participation in the redemption. Well, obviously she couldn't become Guy's mother if she didn't, wasn't born. <laughs> so you could say in a way, the birthday of Mary anticipates the birthday of Jesus, just as the sin of Eve anticipated the sin of, of Adam. So the reversal is the case. And so the birthday of Mary brings her into the, the pipeline, so to speak, of grace, so that when she's presented in the Annunciation with this perfect obedience, she obeys lovingly to reverse Eve's unloving disobedience, and then that allows her to conceive Christ, who then obeys to replace Adam's unloving disobedience. So the things are connected to each other. But I frankly can't remember the origin, just off the top of my head, of the Nativity of Our Lady as a feast. I'm sure it's connected, though, with some particular experience in uh, perhaps in um, the uh, discovery of a church or the building of a church, perhaps, in Palestine. So uh, anyway, I'm looking it up on Wikipedia now. It basically talks about how we commemorate John the Baptist's feast, birthday, and we commemorate our Lord's, of course, birthday. So it's, and, and so it's very fitting that we also dedicate or commemorate the uh, birthday of Mary. The first liturgical commemoration is connected, yeah, this is it, with the 6th century dedication of the Basilica of Our Lady, uh, now called the Church of St. Anne in Jerusalem. The original church built in the 5th century was a Marian basilica erected on the spot known as the Shepherd's Pool and thought to have been the home of Mary's parents. So it's to commemorate the dedication of that church that we now have a feast in the calendar. Why some countries celebrate it more than others? Well, different countries, different cultures have different um, emphases on different devotions. For example, Corpus Christi is celebrated as a holy day of obligation in many countries, Catholic countries in the world. It's not, for example, in ours. And it's not because we have less devotion to the Eucharist. It just has to do with how we commemorate it in regard perhaps to the civil order or something like that. So um, there are special reasons, I'm sure, in those cultures, in their history, for emphasizing the Nativity of Mary. Thanks, Ellie. We appreciate that question today. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Next up is Keith in Brooklyn, New York. He is listening on the TuneIn Radio app. Keith, you're on with Father Brian. Thank you very Thank much. Uh, Father Malady, you speak lovely. Uh, two things I want to ask you. Uh, where did you take public speaking, in high school or college or seminary? Because you speak very <laughs> nicely. And another thing is, if I were... Well, I'm an Episcopalian, Anglo-Catholic, but for, if I wanted to join a religious order, all right, the vow of poverty, oh, fine. But the only thing I want to take is with me are my music instruments. I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I'm a woodwind <laughs> man. I like playing my saxophone. Would Don't I, tell would all I, that you haven't come to give to the poor except for your saxophone and come follow me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me uh, Briefly, let me answer your two questions. Uh, it seems and I only know this because I was told this, that I've always had a talent for public speaking and didn't know it. Well, when I entered the religious life, we had various classes in elocution and reading, and some of them were worthless. 
But I remember one of them, we had a wonderful teacher. She taught both Protestant and Catholic seminarians at Berkeley. That's Berserkley, you know, to you. That's California Berkeley. All right, Father, that's a cliffhanger. All right, hang on to that thought. Don't go anywhere. Keith, hang on there. And all of our other callers, Ann, Justin, Sam, Pat, we'll get to you in just a couple of moments. It's EWTN's Open Line Thursday with Dominican Father Brian Milady. Mother Angelica, Scott Hahn, Father Wade Menezes. You'll hear the leading Catholic voices on the largest Catholic media network in the world. This is the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. When I begin my prayer time, I always enter into it with the expectation that God wants to teach me something. And it has to start with my willingness to share my heart with God, not just say words at Him. So whether I'm using more formal prayers or a more conversational style of prayer, I have to bring my heart and my life and my real self to God. And by having that dialogue, we're able to enter into a deeper relationship, and he's able to show me how to use all the events of my life to draw closer to him. And now, the EWTN Family Prayer with Father Joseph. Family, a prayer that we pray together is a powerful prayer. So please pray together with me our EWTN family prayer. Today we pray for those who have suffered abuse. Lord Jesus Christ, innocent lamb who suffered unjustly for our sake, look with mercy on those who have suffered abuse as children. The wounds they carry are deep and yet are not beyond your reach. Heal them, console them, Free them from the burden they carry and bring a swift end to these terrible acts. Cleanse our churches, our schools, and our homes of all abuse and grant that children everywhere will be welcomed, loved, and cherished. Amen. Is the Bible the sole rule of faith? Are we saved by faith alone? Hear the answers on Called to Communion tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern. Now, back to Open Line with Father Brian Mullady. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. 33288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-EWTN. And we're talking to Keith in Brooklyn, New York, and Father Mullady is in the middle of a story of uh, how he gained some of his public speaking prowess. And then he'll also address the fact that Keith wants to join a religious order and he wants to take his saxophone with him. Right. Well, uh, we had this woman named Mrs. Harris, and she had taught even actors in Hollywood how to enunciate. And we used to love, we all loved Mrs. Harris, and we had to learn these things like, uh, how does the water go down at the door? My little, and we, and we had to emphasize all these syllables like, splashing and washing and crashing and and she go good morning like that and we had to go good morning like this <laughs> and then she'd have us read scripture to her so she'd sit in the back of the room while we were reading and she'd go no i'm not getting it you haven't put me in the moment <laughs> But we love Mrs. Harris. She taught us more than any of our homiletics professors put together. The other thing is the vow of poverty now. You've got to remember what the vow of poverty is about. It's about possessivism, and it's about the desire to dominate other people. And it doesn't mean to say that a person, let's say, that if they have a, like a cherished musical instrument, uh, they, of course they'd have to ask permission from the people in the order to bring it, but if they were using it, especially in the liturgy, let's say, um, they, they could. I, I know the Nashville sisters, whom I'm very close to, I mean, they have a number of great musicians, and one of them plays the kettle drums. So they have this huge set of kettle drums in the Mother House Chapel. <laughs> and uh, I, I assume she probably brought those herself, because I don't think they buy them. But, uh, yeah, I mean, there are certain things where you can... If it's important for formation or for your skills, especially your cultural skills, you know, you could be allowed to have that. 
um, but you'd have to ask them. Thanks. Don't bring a car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Keith. We appreciate you calling back this week. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. Next up is Justin, a first-time caller in Saskatchewan, Canada. Justin, welcome to the program. You're on with Father Brian. Wow. Hello, Hi, Justin. Thank you. Okay. Uh, some context before I ask my question. I'm a Roman Catholic. I'm 27. I've been trying to be confirmed for a while, but none of the priests in my area are getting back to me. And I've been, haven't really been given the opportunity to become confirmed. I've been trying to overcome the sins of the flesh, but I continue to commit the same sin. I've been getting closer to God and trying my best to become a saint. I've been given many revelations that God is calling me to himself, but I continue to fall, fail into mortal sin. I go to the same priest for confession, and I feel that I've been judged and condemned by him because of my many failures and how he reacts to my confession. And I desire the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So what's your question? Like, how, how does one approach it? Like, if I wasn't being given the gifts of the Holy Spirit from confirmation and trying to overcome the sins with those special graces, Okay, well, you do have the gift of baptism, right? Yeah. Okay, well, the Holy Spirit's gifts are conferred in baptism. They're strengthened, of course, especially fortitude and confirmation. But you've already got them, you know. Uh, I said, why you're not confirmed? I believe you have to ask the, the bishop that, or call the chancery office, and tell them you want to be confirmed. Uh, I'm not really sure how far away you are from things up in Saskatchewan. It seems kind of, uh, it, uh, you know, the boonies to me. But may, what do I know? I've never actually been there. But um, you need to try to contact the diocese to see if, if the bishop will, if you can get in on a, a confirmation thing, a RCIA thing or something that will help you with that. Hopefully your priest will help you too. But um, sometimes uh, priests just get frustrated because they try to help people and it doesn't seem to be working. And um, that's, not, that's not any reflection on you. It's just the way people are. We get impatient sometimes. And I don't know if I'd read that much into it unless you're confessing like every day um, for a long time. Uh, the priest might be impatient with that fact. It wouldn't matter what it was you were confessing. So uh, anyway, I encourage you to remember you have the gifts of the Holy Spirit when you're baptized. I do encourage you, however, to seek confirmation to help you become more courageous in help to struggle against these problems that you have. And also, I'd be very careful about saying you receive revelations from God uh, because I don't think that's an easy thing to uh, identify. Uh, I was listening to the former program before mine came on on EWTN, and the fellow was saying, quoting Teresa of Avila, who said that a lot of people get really fooled by their imagination. And, of course, she was one of the ultimate mystics in the history of the church. But, uh, I don't know, people tell me things like all the time, and I remain somewhat skeptical of the whole thing um, regarding things like that. But remember, those private revelations, if you do have them, are not the same as sanctifying grace or the seven sanctifying gifts of the Spirit. So what you want to do is try to focus your attention on regularizing your situation with regard to pursuing the sacrament of confirmation. And if the local priest won't help you with that, then you need to inquire the bishop because, as you know, the bishop is the ordinary minister. The priest would be the extraordinary minister of that. And also, there's, you may have to, he may want you to go through RCIA or something because uh, older Catholics often have to do that if they haven't received it. 
Thanks, Justin. We'll keep you in our prayers. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. Next stop is the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Sam is a first-time caller. He's in Madisonville today, listening on 100.7 FM. Sam, you are on with Father Brian. Hi. Thank you. Good. Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you for your your time and, and talking to me. And uh, just to, to set my question up, if there's such thing as setting it up, I, I am Protestant, uh, but, but I am also uh, I'm, I'm faithful and I want to be correct in my worship. And so if, if I'm not worshiping correctly, then I absolutely want to do that. I, I want to worship correctly. So uh, I used to own a small business. Uh, uh, in Indiana, and a very uh, devout Catholic lady came into my desk to, to pay her her premiums, and and she asked if I had prayed to uh, Mother Mary, and and I said, well, well, no, I I don't pray to the the Mother Mary. I I I said I pray I pray to Christ, and I I'm, I said if if God the Father selected Mary as the vessel to deliver Christ, the human child, from, she had to have been very, very special. She had to have been above reproach, and that's why he selected her. However, uh, my my very own mother was very Christian-like, and as far as I can tell, uh, without What's your blame. question? Well, so, so my, my question is, uh, to 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 assign deity or, or to pray to Mary to ask Mary to talk to Christ for me uh, is, is that uh, as, as a Protestant and again I'm seeking that this is not a not a trick question I'm, I'm genuinely seeking yes well what's your question uh, and why why and how should I pray to another human lady. Uh, as special as she was, why should I pray her, to her? Yes. Oh, I understand your question. Um, look, I, I'll tell you my attitude. I need all the help I can get, all right? And um, Mary is an especially powerful witness because she was, we believe she's the first, she's not a deity, obviously, but she's the uh, first and most holy Christian, and so we, uh, first I mean not in a historical sense, but most important Christian, of believers. And so what we do is we ask her, just like we ask anybody else, let's say I'd ask my father for help on my math homework. That doesn't mean I don't think my teacher's any good. But maybe my father can explain it to me in a better way than my teacher can. So we ask her to help us in order that we can understand more about Christ. And we follow the imitation of Scripture where Mary, remember, before Christ even approached his public ministry uh, with the wedding feast of Cana, she interceded on behalf of the couple. And Christ says to her, well, my hour hasn't come yet. Well, she just ignores him. (laughs) So she says to the steward, do whatever he tells you. So, okay, mom, you know. So that's the way we look on it as... Uh, Our Lady helping us. Um, Padre Pio used to have a joke, which is very Italian in its way, that while the gates of paradise were shut by St. Peter, Mary was sneaking everybody in by the back door, (laughs) the kitchen door. We, We really need to appreciate her. The poet Wordsworth, who I don't believe was Catholic, said she was our tainted nature's solitary boast. And, of course, Scripture says, um, you know, all generations will call me blessed. I mean, well, that's all we're doing is when we ask her and her intercession for things. And, and I like to have everybody involved, all the other saints, too. I ask St. Thomas to help me with my studies, and I ask uh, St. Augustine to help me with my temptations, and I ask... You know, not in the sense that he's God, 
or their God, but in the sense that they intercede with the Father for me. Does that help at all, Sam? But it does a little bit. I had a, a follow-up question pertaining to what he just told me. Sure. If, if I could ask that. Yep, and, sure. And it's with the utmost respect uh, that, that I ask my question, but if if Christ is, is, is who he is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, if they are they're all-knowing, they're, they're past, present, future, and they can hear my prayer because they're a deity and they're God, for a human being who, who Mary, before she was selected as the vessel to deliver Christ, she was a human lady, and she delivered Christ, and, and so, so to know that she is with, I, I have no doubt that she is in heaven with, with Christ, but for me to pray to her, and ask her, like, Mary, can, can you go tell your son, or can, can you ask him to, to have mercy on me in this area or that area? Well, why, and, and this is with the utmost of sincerity, why should I think that a human being is, is pure and, and, and great as she was since, since God the Father selected her to deliver Christ? Why should I think that she could hear my prayer since she was a human being well, because you're making it to her. You know, we're in touch. You see, one of the problems we have with this, especially with Protestants, is that they, they have a great deal of difficulty with physical mediators between God and the soul. And one of those is the church, the community of believers. And so Christ established a community of believers. Um, he's head of his body, the church, says St. Paul. And so the chief member of his body, the church, is Our Lady. Why? Because she loved much. And this is all based on a union of love. And so as, as we ask people in an ordinary human sense to help us, to love us, so it's a communion of friendship. If we have a friendship with Our Lord and Our Lady and St. Joseph and all those people, we have a huge community of people who love and support us. I would say that today, you know, as a result of COVID, we have so many people committing suicide who feel alone. How can you possibly be alone if you're a Christian? All the saints and angels are with you every place you go. And then, of course, our Lord, because he's the head of the body, the church. So uh, my reaction to that is that by nature, we're born into a community. We can't live without a community. Um, Aristotle used to say that the man who can live without others is either a beast or a god. Um, and so we're born into this family and we're born into the um, state. But then in Christianity, because of the Christ's body, we're also born into the community of his church. So we have all these people in his church that want our good. And we want their good. And so we have this marvelous union of friendship and love. And not only support each other, but we ask you know, them to support us with, you could say, the superior, if you want to put it that way. Um, anybody who's in a religious order knows that some people relate to the superior better than others. And sometimes it's best to go indirectly or um, in your family, you know. I mean, so some of the kids recognize that Papa or Mama's more open to some of the others, so they try to go through them. It's not that we don't love Christ, that we don't think Christ is uh, all, but he's all for all of us, for Mary as well as for me. Only she's uh, completed her pilgrimage, and she is rejoicing with him now. I find it very odd that people find this difficult. I, I, of course, I was raised Catholic from my time I was a little boy, so I never found that that difficult. You know, we were making May altars when I was in the second grade, you know, in Mary in the month of May to to ask Mary's intercession and crowning May statues, her statue with roses and things like that. Again, nobody ever told us we, we didn't believe in Jesus. But she leads us to Jesus because her whole life turns around him. And I think most of our Protestant brothers and sisters are fairly comfortable with 
asking their brothers and sisters here on earth to pray for them. And, uh, boy, she's in a much better position to be effective than the folks walking around with us here on earth, huh? Well, and what's interesting is that Luther, you know, who didn't feel called upon to be logical, but he didn't like the veneration of the saints at all for various reasons. But Luther always, to the end of his life, maintained a very devout and loving appreciation of the Blessed Virgin. God bless you, Sam. Thanks so much for that phone call today. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. Be sure to check out Women of Grace later tonight or this morning at 3 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, That's the Encore. You can check it out uh, live at 11 a.m. Eastern Time right here on EWTN Radio. Uh, Next up is Pat in the great state of Ohio listening on St. Gabriel Radio. Pat, welcome to the program. You're on with Father Brian. Pat, are you there? Tell you what, we'll come back to Pat. Next we'll go to Ann in Atlanta, Georgia. She is listening on The Quest today. Ann, you're on with Father Brian Mullady. Yes, Hello, Ann. Hi, Father Brian. Hi, Father Brian. Hey, I have a question. I asked our priest if they were teaching critical race theory in our elementary school at church. And he indicated the diocese is going to look at the good, he described it as a good and a bad critical race theory, and then make, I believe, some recommendations to the parish. Uh, um, what's I IC? Wonder if, uh, Atlanta. You mean the diocese? Oh, the diocese, okay. The Go diocese. Ahead. So the diocese yeah. of Atlanta is going to make a recommendation to their yeah, parish, yeah. their school. So um, what I've heard about critical race theory concerns me and that it seems to fly in the face of our Christian teachings. So I was going to write a letter to the archbishop and express my opposition to CRT. Um, I wonder if you have heard that the other dioceses are considering teaching CRT, the good and the bad. And then um, if you had any suggestions for me to what to include in my letter. Well, my um, first of all, critical race theory is very hard to talk about because no one seems to be able to define it, what exactly it is. Um, my understanding of it is, from watching the news and reading the paper, is that it's the idea that you can that, that certain races are by nature evil, almost you could say, and they have to constantly beg forgiveness for the what race they're in, and that uh, especially the white race, you know, that somehow we're responsible for all the evil of the world. Uh, I'm afraid this smacks to be of racism itself, and um, it's almost like blaming the Jews for the crucifixion of Christ. Obviously, there were Jewish people during Christ's time who called for his death and didn't believe in him. But that's not the same as the Jewish people for the last 2,000 years. And to seek to identify them with some wicked, evil race is, 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 is not Christian. So I think we're critical race theory. If they decide to try to present it in Catholic schools, it may be from something that's politically correct, to try to survive with the state, and the fact that they try to distinguish it between the good and the bad. See, I don't think there is a good side to it, unless you mean we shouldn't discriminate. Yeah, but everybody thinks that. Uh, it flies in the face of even Dr. King's ideas. Or, it's just unconscionable to me that people think that because you're a member of a certain race that you're evil. I just, I don't understand that. And I used to teach in South Central Los Angeles. I mean, I spent my life educating blacks, um, and and I greatly appreciate them. Uh, and, the, and we had a very racially mixed school. So, as you remember, the Archbishop of New Orleans, back in the 60s, excommunicated people who taught segregation. So how could he be guilty of being evil and wicked because he's white? I mean, the whole thing just, uh, 
uh, eludes me. If someone could enlighten me about it, I happen to know that it results from just a few people in the academic environment who had no evidence for what they were saying. But and of course, you know, we've we've experienced the great power of follow the science recently, right? <laughs> Uh, how effective that's been. Well, this isn't even science. This is like myth. And uh, I, as to what you do with the diocese, I really don't know what to say about that. I have a, a feeling that they may be trying to, you know, stave off any attacks by the state concerning Catholic education by going along in some ways, but not in others. Um, if that's the case, well, I'm not sure I would do it, but I, I can't condemn the intention. Regarding the way it's carried out, though, I'd have to see how, it, how they carry it out, and I would, could make a judgment about that once it's done. Thanks, Ann. We appreciate the call. I think we've got Pat back in the great state of Ohio. She's uh, back. Listening on uh-huh. St. Gabriel Radio. Pat, we lost you. We were so sad. We lost you. I'm canning pickles and I dropped my phone and somehow it went off and, <laughs> and I yeah well we're so, here now what's your we question just have a couple Thank minutes you. left what's your question uh, my question is uh, when we um, offer our prayers and sacrifices pain and sufferings up to Christ does he get any relief from our prayers and our sacrifice from his sacrifices and his suffering and does he still suffer in some way All right, this is a very famous problem. Uh, Of course, Jesus doesn't suffer in heaven now. But you remember that the passion has a timeless implication. After all, the Mass were made present at the foot of the cross again. And so we do relieve Christ's sufferings, but in the past. Because when Jesus because of his perfect knowledge was suffering in the garden, for example, he understood all sins and offered himself for all sins that had been or would be committed in the history of the human race. So his wounded sacred heart is consoled by our sacrifices even now. But obviously in heaven he doesn't suffer now, no. Does that help, Pat? Thank you very much, yes. Thank you. We appreciate the phone call here today. And that's going to bring us right up against uh, the top of the hour. Father Brian, I'm glad you safely arrived back in, uh, in beautiful Portland, Oregon. It's all in one piece still, I hope. Uh, the temperatures well, have certainly subsided. <laughs> but it's on its way. to at least we, we saw a great sign because the boards were taken down with the Marriott two days ago. <laughs> well, there you, go. there you go. Father, would you leave us with a blessing? Blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He send upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. On behalf of our host, Father Brian Milady, our producer, Michael McCall, our call screener and social media maven, Mr. Jeff Burson. I'm Jack Williams. Thanks so much for tuning in to Open Line Thursday. We'll round out another great week tomorrow as our very own Vice President of Theology, Mr. Colin Donovan, will be in the house to take your phone calls on EWTN's Open Line Friday. Until we get together then, God bless. God bless.